Uh, welcome. I'd like to welcome everyone to the second part of this session, uh, which is, of course, devoted to the theme government in the service of citizens, a European blueprint. Uh, we have some very distinguished speakers whom I'll introduce in a moment. But first, let me introduce myself. I'm Paul Hoffheins, and I'm the president and co-founder of the Lisbon Council. And we're, of course, a partner in COVAL. You've heard a lot about that already. And we're among the uh, the organizations uh, performing the research that's uh, that's been presented to you here today. Uh, look, this next session is an embarrassment of riches, and you haven't come here to hear me speak. So let me uh, move directly to, uh, uh, to introducing our speakers. Uh, we have uh, Commissioner Johannes Hahn, who I don't know uh, how many of you have been snooping around the uh, participant list, uh, but Commissioner Hahn has been with us for quite some time. Uh, so we're delighted you found time uh, to listen to these presentations uh, today, sir. We're looking forward to hearing what you have to say a bit later. Uh, Commissioner Hahn, for those of you who don't know, is the European Commissioner for Budget and Administration uh, since 2019. It's his third mandate. Uh, prior to that, he was Commissioner for Neighborhood Policy and Enlargement Negotiations, and prior to that, for Regional Policy. Uh, he was also, as many of you know, he was the Minister for Science and Research in the Austrian government uh, back in the day. That's when the Lisbon Council first got to know him. He was, of course, an outstanding um, minister. Uh, who had a, a real presence here in Brussels uh, from his perspective of a national government then. He's also a bit less known, has a background in industry and a PhD in philosophy from the University of Vienna. Um, Sandy Spiker is with us today as well. Uh, Sandy, we welcome you to the call. I know you had to get up very early to hear these presentations. Uh, Sandy, for those of you who don't know her, is CEO of IDEO, the global design and innovation firm. Ideo, of course, works with clients in the Americas, Asia, and Europe across healthcare, education, financial services, the food system, and many other industries and sectors. Uh, Sandy's an internationally recognized expert in designing large-scale systems as a practicing designer and as an educator. She's been widely cited in publications ranging from the New York Times, Quartz, the Wall Street Journal, and even has taught a course at Stanford D School. And if you don't know what Stanford D School is, it's not the same as Stanford B School. Stanford D School is a place, and I quote from their website, for explorers and experimenters that helps people develop their creative abilities. Uh, she's also taught at Washington University of St. Louis, Reading Elementary School, and she serves on the board of IDEO.org, which is a nonprofit dedicated to eliminating poverty in the US, Africa, and to creating a more just and inclusive world. And finally, of course, we have Minister Kyriakos Kyriakakis. Uh, Minister, uh, uh, Minister Kyriakakis is the Minister for Digital Government of the Cabinet of Kyriak Kyriakos Mitsotakis, a uh, very good friend of the Lisbon Council, who, by the way, last time he spoke at the Lisbon Council was the Minister for Public Administrative Reform. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Kyriakakis has a master's in public policy from the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard, as well as a master's in science and technology from MIT, the Massachusetts Institution of Technology, um, as well as bachelor degree in computer science from Athens University of Economics and Business. Um, he's also a fellow think tanker. Uh, we love welcoming think tankers to these discussions. Um, he was director of research at Geonosis, an independent think tank, where he personally produced an array of research papers with a strong focus on economic growth, as well as the perceptions and beliefs of Greek citizens. Uh, he's been an outstanding minister and an inspiration to many on this call. Uh, Commissioner Hahn, if you don't mind, we'll go to you first. And I have three questions that I would like to put to you. Um, what are the upcoming plans and priorities for the European Commission uh, in this area? Um, what's the role of co-creation, design thinking, and the, the things we've been discussing here already and delivering better results for citizens? And last, but by far not least important, how can a, how can a community like this, a group like ours, help. Thank you so much for being with us. The floor is yours. So, thank you very much, uh, colleagues, and uh, thank you for, for the invitation. And Paul, thank you for this kind introduction. And uh, by the way, I consider myself also as a member of a think tank because I used to say <laughs> the commission is the only think tank in the world with an executive power. So, uh, but uh, <laughs> having said all this, um, uh, by by starting answering your question, I think uh, uh, we used to say that every cloud has a silver lining, 
And in that sense, even Corona also has a positive side effect, uh, despite, of course, all the downsides we, we know. We gained a new momentum to speed up uh, digitalization in Europe and in our public uh, services. We were forced to do that. Uh, so, for instance, uh, within PACE, the Commission switched uh, to teleworking for more than 30,000 people, and this is uh, only the beginning. I want to uh, want the European Commission itself to be a digital front runner, using its full potential to engage with uh, Europeans. The future has already started. Nevertheless, uh, digitalization is not only a matter of being fast, but also of doing it uh, the European way. That means citizens and future oriented, interoperable, open, secure, and innovative, or in other words, based on our European values and principles. European digitalization has to ensure freedom, participation, and services for all, unlike others who use technology to reduce uh, freedoms and human rights. Today, I would like to focus on the implementation of the Tallinn and Berlin declarations and to highlight how digitalization, in particular in the public sector, serves citizens and businesses. This is the fundamental to make Europe uh, stronger. And of course, I would like to use this opportunity to praise the research you are presenting today. With its uh, direct link to the user-focused Tallinn Declaration and the value-based uh, Berlin Declaration, it will support our work on future interoperability and digital government policies, firmly based on co-creation and partnership. Digitalization is a political priority for this Commission, simply for the fact that there will be no single market without uh, digital in the future. The pandemic worked in that respect as a catalyst. Digitalization is now the key to recovery and um, resilience. It will help uh, citizens and businesses to navigate the crisis and uh, thus plays an important role, not uh, only in the long-term budget, uh, but also in the special recovery instrument, Next Generation U. At its core, is uh, the so-called recovery and resilience facility with uh, 672.5 billion euro in loans and grants. And here we are talking about uh, 2018 prices. So in reality, it's already a little bit more. Uh, this amount will ensure that member states recovery plan includes a minimum level of 20% to foster digital transition. And I can uh, tell you, we are looking in the uh, draft uh, proposals of member states, and I would say in most of them, this um, threshold of 20% uh, is, uh, is uh, so they, we are far beyond this 20%. Member states understand uh, the need to invest in digital transition. But in addition to that, the Commission will support the sector with uh, funding, not only by instruments such as Digital Europe Program and the Connecting Europe facility, but also via other programs, including Horizon, uh, which is the Research and Innovation Program, or Creative Europe. Of course, all joint EU investments in high performance computing, artificial intelligence, cybersecurity, digital skills, and uh, Electronic IDs are highly relevant for the public sector use um, as they are building the union's common digital infrastructure. Speeding up digitalization requires speeding up digitalization of public administration. Digital public services will accelerate standard procedures and thus free resources for individual help to support citizens and businesses. According to a McKinsey study, this is also a matter of trust. Residents who are satisfied with the public service are nine times, nine times more likely to have confidence in the government. I hope this is uh, motivation enough, but maybe not all governments are aware about this study yet. In a single market where people work, live, and uh, do business beyond borders, 
we need public services serving uh, disappear. Free movement becomes reality when you can get uh, your Portuguese birth certificate in your Brussels commune or when you expand your business with a few clicks from Italy to Poland. Citizens will feel they live in a common single market when a once only system empowers us to better organize our lives and businesses everywhere in Europe. This is clearly the commitment of member states in the Tallinn and Berlin declarations. Digitalization saves time and, of course, money. It promotes a European lifestyle based on trust, openness, and respect of the individual. Working together to find better solutions is a part of the European Union's DNA. That is why interoperability is the core of Europe's digitalization. In my direct area of responsibility, we are working hard on a reinforced interoperability strategy for early 2022. Interoperability is the necessary backbone of a cooperative European data ecosystem. It goes beyond the public sector. It's more than just technical details. It includes the capacities of entities to trust each other, know each other's mandates, and describe data in a commonly agreed fashion. The green transition is a good example why interoperable systems are essential. We can only find smarter transport solutions if we combine the information flow from different areas. That means interlinking mobility data with energy and environmental data to facilitate daily life applications. Interoperability serves the citizens and businesses best if we do it uh, the European way. Of course, there are already different technical solutions on the market promising interoperability, but we need to be prudent. Could we trust all the systems to be secure? And can we be sure they are open and thus adaptable to the specific needs on regional and local levels? Therefore, Europe stands for open source systems, which set common standards and leave room for specific needs. Interoperability allows living up to common values while serving local needs. This is European subsidiarity at its best, united in diversity. Developing open source and interoperable systems ensure a European independence. But at the same time, they are the opposite of a fortress Europe. They are an offer to the world. The career of the European data protection rules prove how well this works. We already have adequacy agreements with several other like-minded countries such as Canada, Japan, and New Zealand. European standards became global, creating security and trust. Building on our values strengthens not only our strategic autonomy, but also our international rule. A stronger Europe also builds on a public sector, creating an environment of innovation. More than ever before in pre-digital times, it's important to reach out to the private sector. In close cooperation with innovative businesses, often local SMEs and uh, European startups, public administration can experiment with trustful use of new technologies such as uh, blockchain and artificial intelligence. This uh, so-called GovTech setup requires a change of traditional public sector approaches and more use of innovative procurement tools. I believe a strengthened European interoperability strategy can set the necessary framework for a collaborative EU GovTech ecosystem to emerge. We will also promote the European approach of finding better solutions together with our new GovTech incubator. Let me give you an example. If we need a European tool for citizens' participation, it's best to join forces and to find cross-border and cross-domain ideas. That is why we did uh, the platform uh, use for the debate on the future of Europe. Uh, and already today, the respective uh, commissioner in charge reported about um, 
first, um, uh, so say, contributions to the debate using uh, this platform and uh, also their analytical capacity, if I may say so. Uh, we, another example, adapted a tool initially developed by civil society in Barcelona. Um, the aim is to serve citizens and companies better by improved user-centric services as well as more security and transparency in public services. All of this will offer great opportunities for startups and SMEs in a growing GovTech market and thereby strengthen Europeans, uh, Europe's competitiveness. European digitalization is a question of trust in European values and in the principal idea that uh, digitalization serves the people and not vice versa. Therefore, the European public digital service requires a culture of cooperation. This will help us to accelerate the transformation, to use investments smartly, and to find better solutions together. This event is uh, another good example of joining forces. We need to co-create at the European level uh, to safeguard and speed up local transformation, to serve citizens and companies, to inspire ideas, to attract investments, to cooperate with neighbors and partners all around the world. So I'm looking forward to building this stronger Europe together with you. It's necessary to have many, many allies and uh, people pushing and stimulate this uh, transition. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Commissioner. If you don't mind, I'd like to abuse the microphone briefly just to ask you two questions right away uh, before we go to Sandy Spiker. Um, first, I'm interested in the role that co-creation uh, plays in your life. Um, the European Commission is, of course, part of a very large ecosystem. You have the Council and the Parliament uh, to deal with, uh, to come to a decision on anything, and quite a few departments uh, within the Commission, too. I think you've headed three of them uh, yourself. Uh, I think it's no secret that uh, not everyone gets along all the time. I'm just wondering um, what role co-creation might play uh, in, uh, in driving change and reform and public administration within the European Commission and within the European institutions. And if you don't mind a second question, and I apologize, but you'll have to be brief in your answers too. Um, you mentioned the interoperability strategy coming in 2022. We're very interested in that as are many people. I'm just wondering what, what incentives do you foresee uh, for member states uh, to go along with it? Uh, what's, the, what's the win for member states uh, in showing greater dedication to this policy uh, going forward? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Paul, for the two questions. Uh, first, on co-creation, I think one of the most important things is to, to overcome silo mentalities. Uh, and that's why it is so crucial to, to have this uh, uh, principle in place, but not only as a principle, but also to apply it and to live up to it. Uh, I, I think uh, uh, in the meantime, we have made uh, some progress, but uh, uh, a lot has to be done. And uh, I think uh, the last uh, year has, has given up a lot of push on this, but it has also shown that uh, working on, on new solutions, on new tools, etc., also means that uh, people sitting together around the table. Uh, you can also see some, some limitations if you only use, uh, so to say, um, the, the remote um, sure. uh, opportunities. Uh, I think uh, it's another proof that we need uh, uh, both elements of the two different uh, worlds. And this brings me to the second interoperability. I think uh, member states, regions, etc., would benefit a lot if we could uh, save time and money uh, if uh, certain procedures, certain processes are simply accelerated in the way that uh, uh, we are not uh, forced to send, uh, uh, so to say, uh, letters and I don't know what, uh, and, 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 and have a physical exchange, but uh, really use the opportunities. And I think also the last year has uh, given us a, a sense uh, what are the potential of this. And uh, this is why I have together with the Portuguese uh, presidency, which is currently chairing the union, uh, organized or will organize 
an informal ministerial conference of ministers being charged of public administration really to, to work on this uh, and to make uh, a lot of improvements. Uh, but also this is only achievable if there's there are joint efforts and if everybody is committed to it. And then of course, I think Europe can benefit a lot. And if this uh, spirit of interoperability is then also translated in a kind of interoperability between private business uh, sector and public administration and vice versa, it gives another uh, sort of say push and another uh, opportunity. And here we can really lead, for example, uh, also uh, beyond Europe. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sandy Spiker, uh, you know, at the Lisbon Council, we used to give awards out for frequent flyer miles, the person who'd come the furthest uh, to be with us. Uh, but of course, in the era of WebEx and Zoom, uh, you can address us uh, right there from your house or your or your office. What I'm saying is uh, Sandy's coming to us from California. Good morning, Sandy. I know it's very early there and we're delighted you could get up early to be with us today. Uh, Sandy's, of course, an expert uh, on um, not just design thinking, but all of the things that are happening worldwide. Uh, the many, many institutions and people who are using design thinking uh, to address societal challenges and other things. Um, we, I believe you have a presentation for us. Uh, we look forward uh, to seeing that and in particular to hearing what you have to say about the crucial question here, which is how can we use all of this comment and theory and research uh, to deliver uh, real benefits uh, to European citizens and to everyone around the world. Sandy, the floor is yours and thank you again for being with us. All right, thank you, Paul. And uh, thank you for the invitation to be here today with, with you all. Um, I'm gonna hold you to that award for the most travels because <laughs> in the world of digitization, <laughs> we still have to uphold some old traditions. So, yes. well, I'm sorry to not be with you all in person, but I'm glad we could still figure out a way to be together. Um, so as Paul mentioned, I'm the CEO of IDEO. And for those of you that don't know IDEO, um, we basically spend our days immersed in these kind of co-creation processes that you're discussing here today. And I'm here to share some stories about design thinking and how it is inherently an approach to co-creation that is being used to make progress on social challenges. Um, I, I wanna say I love the way that David opened the event earlier today with the question, how might we serve our citizens better? I think there cannot be a more noble question to be asking. So I'm so pleased to hear that you're holding it. Um, and your definition in the policy brief that you launched um, is really excellent. I love the point that fundamentally services and experiences can be better designed by listening, by imagining, by prototyping and learning and iterating, and most importantly, engaging people in the process as both users and designers. And this is where digitization isn't just about the technology, it's about our practices, about how we connect with each other, how we use the benefits of scale and accessibility and uh, adaptability. So for many people, the words design and design thinking might conjure up certain images. Maybe it's um, colorful post-it notes stuck on an office wall or a framework that you might have learned in a brief workshop or even thinking about the next version of a product that you hold in your hand. But of course, it's so much bigger than that. The challenges that we're facing today as a society are urging us to use a designer's mindset, which is things like curiosity and empathy and optimism, along with a designer's skill set, a depth of craft, creativity, and design methodology to develop solutions that work for the many, not just the few. And that belief is essential when you're working at the scale of government because you exist in service of everyone's well being. We've already started talking about this, but the global pandemic that we're all experiencing has really shown us that our foundational systems, the institutions that are meant to bind us together are starting to fail us. And whether it's on purpose or not, it is all by design because our systems were built by people, by us, and they were not built with the needs of all people in mind. And that's why we need to get really good at these co-creation methods that you're pointing to to become better designers, better collaborators, and better builders of our societal systems to better serve our citizens. 
So today I thought I would share two stories of how design thinking has been used to co-create systems. And I hope that you'll see how they respect and value people um, and their wisdom in order to get to new outcomes. There are stories that IDEO has been a part of over multiple years um, where we've gone really deep in designing with people across communities with diverse needs. And I'm gonna share some slides because I'm a visual person um, and they're just images. So um, don't, don't, don't worry <laughs> that the information isn't on the slides. Um, let me just get the screen share going. Share. Great. Can you all see this? Yes. yes. All right. So um, first, I'm going to take it out, out to Los Angeles County here in the US. Uh, Los Angeles County is the largest voting jurisdiction in the US. They have about 5 million voters. And for decades, the experience of voting was super frustrating to people. The ballot itself was confusing and hard to read. Um, the time for voting was really constrained because, you know, um, uh, because, because people work, because people have lives and to be able to, to only vote in once, um, one particular day caused a lot of constraints for people in a way that it just caused them to choose to not vote. Um, and the officials in LA County wanted to create a system that would make it easier and more engaging for people to vote. And that would be adaptable so that they could evolve over time as people's needs change. And so of course, as many of you know, people have a wide range of needs when it comes to voting. Some voters are vision or hearing impaired, or they arrive at the precinct in wheelchairs. Others have disabilities or are unfamiliar with technology. And people are of all ages and all backgrounds and speak many different languages. And as designers, we need to understand all of these needs. But it's not just about the voters' needs. There are also many different players in the ecosystem of voting, and they all have needs too, whether that's poll workers or volunteers or county commissioners. So as a result of all of this input in partnership with multiple organizations, a new set of solutions were created, some of which needed to be manufactured and some of which needed policy change. And I'll just give you a few examples here. There's a touchscreen device that allows voters to adjust the angle of the screen. Um, so they, and also allows them to choose from the many languages spoken across the county for their ballot, which wasn't the same case when they had the printed um, ballots. If you're vision impaired, you can use a tactile keypad or have a ballot narrated through your headphones. This photo on the right is one of my favorites. Um, it's Stevie Wonder. I don't know if do you all know Stevie Wonder. I can't really see you, but I see some people nodding and thumbs up. So Stevie Wonder, who is a vision impaired um, performer, he he was um, engaged in giving feedback on the voting system. So here's him using a, a an early prototype. Um, and as part of the design of this system, the sorry, I love that photo so much I got distracted. Okay, so as part of the as part of the design of the system, also it wasn't just about the device. It's about the um, the way that the system can engage with people. They in the process we decided to expand the number of voting centers from a few to hundreds to make it pe easier for people to access. And anyone registered in the county can vote at any of these centers rather than only the one most close to them. There's also an extended voting period as part of this design, which is not the norm in America, so that we could accommodate different people's needs. It's, I, I would take the whole hour if I shared with you all the ways that people were engaged in this process. But I wanna say they really come down to engaging with people to, to know their experiences, hear their ideas, and get feedback on what the experience can be like. And you know, participatory democracy only really works if every voter not only feels like they're part of the system, but is treated as such. And LA um, debuted this system last year. So I'm gonna point to some of the outcomes here. And it's, it's quite hard to um, single out what factors might have driven this outcome. But LA County saw a 28% increase in votership um, as they launched this system. They had 4.3 million people voting compared to 3.3 million in 2008. So 
we will continue to learn about the system. LA County will continue to learn about the system and iterate upon it. And the, the best part is that it's owned by the county. It's something that they have created and they now have processes, ongoing processes to iterate on this experience. All right, I'm gonna cruise you around the world now over to Peru. And we're gonna move from uh, voting to education. So I don't know how many of you might've been to Peru or seen schools in Peru, but um, historically Peru has one of had, had one of the lowest performing school systems in the world. They still are in a rote learning um, pedagogical experience. There are um, quite naive teachers. Um, there's a lack of educational standards and a lot of the infrastructure is crumbling. One of the prominent, most prominent leaders in the country, uh, Carlos Rodriguez Pastor, wondered how he could help change the system. He was already a successful business leader developing services for the emerging middle class. And he decided that he could do something for his country by creating a school system that would be both international quality and affordable for the emerging middle class. So, because that answer isn't already there, it needed to go through a design process. And in that process, it began, of course, as we're talking about today, in engaging so many people around considering the future of learning, parents and teachers and children especially. Everyone also is a stakeholder in education, so we had to collaborate with government officials, business leaders, and thought leaders from around the world. And we asked them to all design with us. What makes learning valuable? How might we support teachers to learn and grow? How might we inspire and evaluate students in a way that feels validating and engaging? How might we design a system that can also learn and grow over time? And the result is Innova Schools. It's a system that's been designed from the ground up. And since it launched, Innova has opened more than 60 schools in Peru. It's now the nation's largest private school network, and it currently serves more than 50,000 students. And you know, I know when you hear private school, maybe you're thinking that it's expensive, but the goal of the system was to create an affordable system that Peru's emerging middle class could access. I think it might cost around um, $2,000 per month to educate a European student. And here at Innova, the cost to families is only $150 per month. And not just that, students are testing at levels two to three times the national average in math and communications. And the World Economic Forum identified Innova as one of three benchmark school systems in the world. Innova has already expanded to Mexico and is becoming an education model for Latin America. But the best part is that they're constantly iterating on the design of the schools and the curriculum. Their system has a central innovation team that routinely works with teachers, parents, and students to understand their needs, incorporate and scale best practices, and also look ahead to how to, how to design schools in the future. They've made schools themselves a learning system. All right, I'm gonna go off of screen share, just conclude here. So I hope that these examples bring to life the idea that design thinking is a rigorous approach that can get us to the kind of outcomes we seek, especially when done with dedication and with the engagement of people at the core of the process. Design has taken on so many new forms these days from designing services and experiences that are fit for our digital era in ways that are more inclusive, helping to transform organizations to center on purpose, better care for their employees, routinely innovate and build more agile ways of working. And also design is being used to help evolve systems through radical collaboration across individuals and organizations. With all of these complex questions as part of our remit, it is really clear that designers have an immense responsibility to care for people through the process of design. People are relying on us and what we create to support them in ways that shape their lives. And more than ever, we need to be conscious of evolving our work processes to be more inclusive more embedded in community and more participatory. I'm so happy that you all are here for this conversation. And I really look forward to seeing what happens in Europe over the coming years.
Okay, thank you for that, Sandy. If you don't mind, because we're running a little bit late on time, I'm going to go straight to Minister Piriakakas, but we will come back to you uh, with some questions in a moment. Uh, Minister, we're delighted to have you with us, um, not just because it's an honor, which it would be any day of the week, uh, but in particular uh, because of your achievements uh, in Greece around these dossiers uh, that we've been discussing here. Um, I know you'll be telling us a little bit about that in your remarks. Uh, so I'll uh, I'll stop there and pass the floor uh, to you and say ordinarily you'd have gotten the frequent flyer uh, award, but uh, coming to us all the way from Athens. Uh, but I think Sandy has uh, urged you out a little bit this time. Minister, the floor is yours. Thanks for being with us. Thank you so much. And uh, let me begin by saying how delighted I am to be with you and uh, that the Lisbon Council is doing a tremendous job vis-a-vis -vis bringing together politicians with uh, leading experts in technology and technology policy. And this is something uh, which is much necessary, especially, I would say, uh, these times. Now, having said this, I have to say I'm also delighted because of the topic of the discussion, because creating services together, service design, is actually at the nucleus of what we have been trying to achieve uh, in Greece in the last uh, one year and a half, uh, since I would say July 2019 where we created this new organization uh, that I'm leading, the Ministry of Digital Governance, which uh, we have been internally saying that we should have called it the Ministry of Service Design. And this is why uh, I was very happy to hear Sandy's remarks before, because in reality, we understood, I think, quite early on that service design and the proper co-creation of services in order to better serve citizens and corporations is actually the, our KPI, what we should have been trying to achieve overall. Um, to this regard, uh, prior to the last election, as you mentioned, Paul, I was a think tanker. Prior to the last election, we uh, established uh, a new plan, a new plan for digital policy, a new organization, actually, which uh, took uh, new capacities with regards to interoperability. And uh, the KPI was to diminish administrative burdens in Greece. In reality, uh, help citizens be better served by the state, have the Greek state act as an enabler, uh, and as a mechanism of empowerment and not as an impediment, uh, which is what uh, uh, it was perceived uh, up until uh, recently. Um, having said this, the core of our policy and what we uh, have been attempting to do is better codified by a platform, a platform that we were originally inspired uh, by the UK example, in that case, Gov.UK. We understood that creating a similar platform, a bit more service driven in our case, Gov.GR would be much closer uh, to our needs, and it would be an enabler as well uh, with regards to having citizens be served by a single point of reference. We created GAP.GR last year uh, during the first lockdown, uh, the beginning of the pandemic. We started by 501 digital services. What we did on day one was, ag was simply aggregating all the pre-existing digital services of the Greek state that worked. It might seem as something very easy to do or very simple, but uh, on day one, we were actually receiving congratulations for services that citizens didn't even know about. So this was effectively a service design approach, have a single portal where the state serves citizens. And then we started adding services according to what principle? A very simple principle, the Pareto rule, uh, that 20% 20 20 of one thing can be 80% of another thing. So there are certain services which are most frequently used by citizens, the power of attorney, for instance, driver's licenses, e-prescriptions. So within a year, uh, from March 2020 uh, to April 2021, we have more than doubled the services offered at the government portal, and now we have more than 1,100 uh, plus services currently uh, being offered. And uh, I want to connect this with what Commissioner Han said before, that in reality, this is a question about values, because what we understood, I think, uh, during the first lockdown is actually very much connected to an op-ed uh, written by Yuval Harari in the FT uh, last March, March 2020, where what he effectively said was that after a couple of years, the pandemic will be over, but what will remain are your technological choices uh, as states. So the choices that we made had at their core a very simple word, the word empowerment. We took an already existing strategy that we had since 2019, simplify services, better serve citizens, have service design at the core of the offering, and we instrumentalized this policy as a tool to battle the virus because we understood, I think, quite early that as we're simplifying uh, services, as we're digitizing, as we're serving citizens and corporations digitally, we're also helping uh, to battle the virus, ensuring state continuity from home 
and uh, the numbers showcase that uh, this worked quite well. Uh, all the digital interactions that citizens had either directly or indirectly with the Greek state. If you compare 2018 to 2020, we had a leap of 11 times up uh, from 8.8 .8, uh, million interactions to 11 um, from to, one, to 94 uh, million uh, interactions. And uh, this is what we have been trying to do as well uh, with our vaccination platform. Uh, the vaccination platform that we have in Greece was designed uh, from a service design perspective. We wanted it to be digital A to Z, and we wanted to create channels that would be very easy for citizens to access. So in reality, very briefly, we had two digital channels rather than one. The obvious channel was to create a digital platform similar to the one that airline companies, for instance, have where you book your two appointments for the vaccine. So that was, I would say, the easy part of the equation in accordance with the population groups uh, that uh, the, the vaccination committee decided upon. The second channel, the second digital channel, was instrumentalizing the e-prescription platform that we launched a year back, where citizens had actually entered their data with regards to their address and their age and some basic information. So what we said actually was that we pitched to citizens that if you're enrolled in the e-prescription system and you have given us your data so that we know your, your address or your age, we will come to you and we will offer you uh, the, uh, the appointments for the vaccine. You don't have to do anything else. All you need to do is confirm it or, or not. And if you don't want to confirm it, then you can go to the other channels that we have developed, the platform uh, being the, the other digital channel or some physical channels. Now, in the physical channels as well, there was a service design approach. I think it was a wise decision not to use call centers. We have seen that all over the world call centers haven't worked at all vis-a-vis uh, -vis vaccine appointments because I think it was self-evident that, uh, especially as we started from the older population groups, having call centers uh, receive as many calls as possible on day one wouldn't have been feasible for them to serve citizens. But we knew that we needed to develop physical channels for those who are not digitally skilled or for those who don't have uh, some people to help them. So what we did there uh, was that we have 11,000 pharmacy stores in Greece, quite many actually, they have an SME structure. So, and those pharmacy stores already have access to the prescription system. So we instrumentalized the pharmacy stores uh, as physical places where citizens can book their appointments. And we added another thousand citizen service centers, which we already have in Greece, um, for uh, a second physical, let's say, layer for appointment booking. If you add all four together, this is all service design. Even though it's the digital ministry together with the Ministry of Health designing it, in reality, we tried to design a system which was fully digital, uh, also with regards to the vaccine centers as well where everybody has a tablet, where everybody has a QR code as they go there. Thus, it was quite easy for us to go ahead and propose an extension to this system, and I'm referring to the vaccination certificate, because as we had a system which was fully digital to begin with, the vaccination certificate was very easy for us to be offered as a proposition uh, to be issued by the system, and we didn't really have, we didn't really need too much time uh, to adapt. Now, uh, this vaccination platform overall has proven to be successful, and it has also proven to be successful on a second front. And the second front being um, showcasing uh, citizens what we are hoping to do overall using digital technologies in the Greek state. So we're digitizing, we're offering up services uh, through our government platform. Identity is a huge issue as well. Uh, we're we have procured the identity cards similar to the Estonian paradigm but we're very much in accordance with the EA does directive and we're trying to create a wallet of identities using the identity <coughs> platforms of the banking system, using the identity platform of our tax system and offering up access to services of different layers. And uh, I'm saying this because as Commissioner Han said before, interoperability is not only a discussion for the public sector, it's a discussion about the private sector as well. And it's, I think it's uh, interesting for us to hear this because next week we're launching a new service and know your customer service for the Greek banks, which is effectively our first service where we're interoperating with the banking system in Greece, because the banks themselves have bureaucratic processes, asking citizens to visit their guichets, uh, to offer uh, tax information, etc. So again, this will be happening in Greece by next week uh, through our interoperability platform through the government portal. And uh, we're starting from the banks, we will 
will continue with the telecom operators, we will continue with energy companies, and we fully understand that this, uh, this discussion, always in accordance with uh, the GDPR, is a discussion that we need to move forward as quickly as possible. And uh, on a final note, um, the RRF, uh, given that in Greece we have developed a very concrete strategy, uh, which we call the Digital Bible, which is not only a strategy, it's an implementation plan. We have codified 448 specific projects, small or large, that we plan to implement uh, within the next four years. The RRF is a unique opportunity for us. It's a Marshall Plan for our age. In order to implement 100% uh, of this strategy and fully complete this leapfrogging attempt that we have been trying to do for this last one year and a half. Having said this again, uh, thank you so much for the invitation and I'm very much eager to hear your thoughts and questions. Minister, thank you. And let me first of all address uh, the participants who are on this call who haven't had a chance to speak yet. Uh, we're going to turn to questions in a moment, so please start putting them in the chat room. Uh, technology permitting, uh, I won't just read them out, we will call on you to ask them. Uh, so be ready to stand by to switch on your camera and uh, switch off uh, your mute. Uh, in the meantime, I'm going to abuse the platform again and ask the minister a question. Um, minister, first of all, no one's ever come to a Lisbon Council session and described themselves as the Minister of Service Design uh, before. Uh, but I think that's really quite fantastic, and that makes you an honorary member of the Lisbon Council for all time. I hope that every government will have a Minister of Service Design going forward. It's a great idea. Um, my question was going back to the Commissioner's remarks about the interoperability strategy that will be relaunched next year. Uh, how, in your view, in particular, given your experience in Greece, can we take all of this experience to scale? Uh, how can we uh, get, uh, get real interoperability in Europe, uh, co-creation going elsewhere? Uh, what does it take to go from local to national uh, to European? I think you're muted. Good. So, uh, in reality, I don't think that there is a unique size fits all approach that one can adopt. I think, uh, unfortunately, everybody has to be a little bit ad hoc here because everybody has to in implement their own gap analysis with regards to what's necessary. For instance, in our case, we needed to do a series of legislative reforms on day one and organizational reforms. The key reform in the Greek case, I have to say, was um, uh, empowering this office, the Office of the Minister of Digital Governance, with the capability to interoperate every database that exists in Greece, also, of course, on the basis of the GDPR. This didn't exist before, and exactly because everybody had to sign off this interoperability between the various data sets, interoperability never happened to the extent that it should, because everybody has a silo mentality, as mentioned before. So in reality, we removed, we created a new layer of capability within our government where interoperability can happen if there is a green light from this ministry. And we have the technical scale to do this through our interoperability center, we have a general secretariat of information systems. Our cloud policy is implemented there. Our interoperability policy is implemented there. So in effect, we centralized policy for interoperability directly under the prime minister's office. Why did we decide to do this directly under the prime minister's office? Because government <coughs> has been traditionally good at vertical policy and traditionally not good at horizontal policy. In order to implement horizontal policy, you need to showcase that the horizontal project is effectively the project of the head of state or head of government. This is the case here, and I guess this is part of the answer why we have managed to move ahead at speed. Terrific. Thank you. I see also a question from Elke Vinickers from the city of Rotterdam. Uh, Chris, if you could uh, unmute uh, Elke and Elke, if you'd like to ask your question uh, directly to uh, Sandy Spiker, uh, it would be our very great honor and pleasure. Yeah, that would be very nice. Um, thank you. Um, so my question was kind of that uh, I'm working as a designer at the city of Rotterdam. Um, and uh, while you were talking about the responsibility designers have for the future world we're creating. Um, and I'm sort of wondering whether uh, that like all of that responsibility should lie in the hands of the designer and i'm wondering how we can make like others um responsible for the process and the result as well it's such a good question and um i do think that that's what this whole conversation about co-design starts to bring us to where before we might have thought that as designers of the system we're doing that for people and design now is evolving to really understand that it's not just about designing for, 
It's also about designing with, and in some cases, designing by, where as designers, we actually don't um, solve the problem, but we engage others to solve for themselves. And I think that a lot of the um, work is really figuring out what question needs what methodology um, and, and who owns what in the, in the decisions and how can we help where people own decision space. So sometimes, for instance, in our, um, in our work in education at, that I mentioned in Peru, um, there's a lot to design in to help the teachers own how certain parts of the system evolve um, to create feedback loops where parents can engage in giving feedback into that system, where kids can actually um, engage in that. And sometimes that means creating representative councils. Sometimes it means actually helping um, others build design capabilities themselves. And this is where I think that like the methods of design now get to mature so much and deepen and expand, but also us as designers get to use a lot of different ways of orienting and find the right place to be enabling others to take that ownership. Okay, right. Thank you. I see uh, a question also here. Uh, I can't tell if this is from, I think it's from Michael Burnett. Uh, uh, would you like to uh, unmute and ask your question uh, directly to uh, Minister Purakakis? Oh, can you repeat the, the, the Michael Burnett is uh, joining Who is us the, from... the last one you just, okay. Well, you put it in my chat here. The... Is, that Beatrice, uh, sorry, is that Beatrice Del Monte? It's unclear. Who's asking this question? Awesome experience from Greece. What has been the impact internally with civil service? Who asked that? Can you unmute them, please, Chrissa? Yes, uh, the digital platform. Okay. Yes, she's not here. She's not able to ask uh, the question. We have to read it out. Well, I'll ask it then. Okay. Uh, the question is: Awesome experience from Greece. What has been the impact internally within civil service teams? And has there been any significant change in their way of working? Beyond remote working and such, I do believe that's for Minister Pirakakis. I have to say that in reality, uh, this question is altered by the fact that since last year we have been also experiencing a, a pandemic. So, in this regard, what the pandemic did is that uh, it acted as a digital accelerator, meaning that what was outstanding, what was perceived as necessary. Uh, became absolutely necessary uh, during the pandemic. So in this regard, what we have been doing is that we're ensuring state continuity. Thus, the civil service has endorsed the changes. To make to make a very quick analogy, actually a very quick example of what we have been trying to do and how the public service is also helping, let me use the following case. The birth of a child. The bureaucracy behind the birth of a child up until last March 2020 involved five bureaucratic steps visiting five different public services in Greece. The hospital, the citizen service center to get a social security number, the registrar's office, the municipality, and the pension fund of the father or of the mother to enroll the child. This is the very definition of bureaucracy. So in reality, what we did was that we used the interoperability center and now everything is happening at the hospital. Uh, and the parents receive an SMS with the, social, with the social security number and the second SMS that tells them whether or not they will be receiving a state stipend. Now, in order to do this, we had to change laws, we had to create systems, and public servants needed, in a sense, to have a new role, because previously they had uh, to interact with citizens directly, now they had to interact with systems, or even not. They had to be, uh, they had to uh, have new responsibilities within uh, their respective public services. I think that everybody quite understands that this is necessary to do, that it's necessary to implement this leap. And in reality, we're not seeing resistance. We're seeing actually a will for change. And I think that this is uh, qu quite uh, optimistic, but also realistic statement. Okay, thank you. And I think a moment ago, I saw uh, Commissioner Hahn uh, taking uh, copious notes uh, on Minister Pirakakis' uh, intervention, in particular, what he had to say about interoperability. Would you like to respond to some of those comments, Commissioner? Is there anything else uh, you would like to uh, come back on that's been said in this session? Uh, maybe more on a, let's say, political note, uh, <laughs> you were asking me in your first question about the effects of interoperability. And I think uh -huh. one, one, we should not under, underestimate this uh, interoperability contributes to much more transparency. Uh, um, actions, uh, procedures are more traceable. Uh, and this is also extremely important uh, when it comes to be 
more accountable to our citizens. So I think there are so many effects and the minister was also talking now about, so to say, potential savings, not only in terms of money, but also in terms of um, time for our citizens, if things can be done, so to say, in a more one-off setting. But uh, I wanted to stress this element of uh, transparency linked to interoperability, which I consider as a very crucial one and gives more also reassurance to our citizens. Okay, thank you. And I have a question from my colleague, uh, David Osimo, about uh, the uh, slow government processes and the immediate needs of citizens. David, would you like to ask the question uh, directly of the minister? Well, that's an honor. Thank you very much. I didn't expect this. Well, it's just that you mentioned the need for, for urgent action and for uh, you mentioned so many new services yes. being set up, but at the same time, we are used to uh, the slowness of uh, government processing in setting up, in launching new services, in procurement, and so how did you balance the two needs? How did you overcome? How did you manage to 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 face this uh, this new challenge and uh, and deliver service in such a short time? He's muted. I think they're doing that there. Chris, did you get him? Is he on? Minister, I think you're on now. No, I'm on. I think this, is, this was the million dollar question before we began. Uh, <laughs> why? We fully understood that the, the procurement timeframes can be problematic, right? Especially when you're trying to procure. I think this is actually a structural risk overall. Uh, for why? Because technology. Uh, has a different life, it has a different time scale, right? A different, uh, it ages more quickly than traditional infrastructure and procurement rules have been designed, I would say, for the investment priorities of a previous era. But the good thing about IT is that uh, on certain aspects, some systems are large that you can't avoid uh, if your state is trying to obtain uh, an ERP system or a CRM system or something from scratch. Then you have to procure traditionally, but if you're trying to develop a small platform, or if you're trying to do what was said before, interoperate between two systems, those things are small projects. And small projects can be actually procured quite fast, or on certain things, not many, you can do your own capacity building within the state. So, in a sense, we tried to do everything together. We tried to procure the large systems, and we have been trying to do this as much as we can. We try to develop certain platforms given our own capabilities and the people and the talent that we manage to bring internally, but also taking advantage of the good people that we already have within uh, our existing structures. And we procured small systems, agile systems, uh, as quickly as possible. And in those 1,100 services that I mentioned, you will find small extensions of pre-existing systems or connections and interoperabilities between others. And you will see humongous value in that. The best example that I can share is the fact that Greece had an e-prescription system since 2013, but the e-prescription system only had an interaction with doctors. So in reality, the citizen never had access to that system. What we did was a simple extension to a pre-existing system. We added a layer where you could uh, give us your mobile phone or your email and your address. And then whenever the doctor prescribed, you received the prescription on your mobile phone. And guess what? This was instrumental during the during lockdown, and it was extremely instrumental during vaccinations. And it was a small project, which was a simple extension of a pre-existing system. So, in a sense, it's like squeezing an apple. It's like it's like squeezing uh, everything that you already have in order to get the maximum out of it. And this is, I think, what we have managed uh, to attain so far. Okay, thank you. I know that uh, the commissioner has to go to another meeting in a moment, uh, so we're going to come to our last round of questions and commissioner, I'll go to you first. I'm going to ask the same question of all three of our very distinguished speakers with commissioner on. Uh, first, uh, in the previous session, uh, Keith Shaw from Northumbria University uh, said that we need more research in this area. So, my question to you is basically this, uh, what will you take away from this very interesting and rich discussion today? And what are those questions that, in your view, are still on the table? Um, what we, could we do in the future that could, that, could, that could advance this debate and continue to bring greater understanding? 
not just for researchers, uh, but how we can deliver these better services we're talking about. Uh, Commissioner Hahn, uh, we'll let you go first, and thank you for being with us. I know you have a hard stop at five, which I think we just hit, but maybe you could say a few words before you leave. Thank you very much. What we didn't um, raise today, but which really linked to all this, is uh, sort of the issue of artificial intelligence. And just today, we adopted in the college um, a communication about um, a future kind of regulation, how to deal with uh, artificial intelligence. And many of this will certainly affect also public administration, but it's also an area where a lot of uh, research can and should be done, but with, which will definitely change our uh, not only way of working, but also uh, the qualification of our civil servants. Uh, it will um, relieve many people from routine work, but uh, there's also a need to upgrade skills or to have a requalification of people. So I think there are a lot of potentials. For instance, uh, if I take, uh, you mentioned uh, the different services which are under my uh, control, one of them is uh, General Directorate for uh, uh, Translation. These are the ones who uh, translate uh, um, written texts. Uh, in, and uh, last year we had, uh, uh, I think, more than 3 million pages to translate. Uh, this was an increase of 20%. Also, we had over the years a decrease of around 20% of people. But this was only achievable due to the necessary programs in place. And may I say we have a translation program in place, which is according experts equally uh, um, excellent, at least like the Google translation system. And uh, there will be a lot of uh, further developments. And I have tasked my people to reach out to colleagues first within the commission, but later on, of course, other EU institutions and, uh, and then um, public administrations in member states uh, to see what can be, so to say, future developments in this area. Because if I take, for instance, uh, uh, the current multi-annual financial framework, which came just into, into force at the beginning of this year, we managed to have an increase uh, in all budget lines with one exception. And this was uh, public administration and salaries. Also, we have almost doubled the budget. Uh, so that means we have to see how we can optimize the way we are working, uh, and this is only possible if we look into into sort of say potentials and savings, and this can only be achieved uh, by implementing more artificial intelligence and having more um, um, uh, sort of say, uh, tools uh, available in order really uh, to keep this level of performance we had in the past and ideally even improve it. But thanks again for this uh, inspiring uh, hour uh, together with all of you and listening in particular to the colleagues. Thank you, Commissioner. I hope we can co-create some great policies together with you in the coming years as well. Um, Sandy, uh, if I could uh, put the same uh, question uh, to you, what will you take from this discussion? Um, and what questions do you think we've left on the table uh, for the next round? Thanks, Paul. Um, there are two things that come to mind that I'm taking from this session and very inspired by. Um, I think the first is really that we must hold the concerns of now at the same time as we're creating the future. Um, and I felt that from the minister in Greece that there's brave action required in order to do this. And it's a careful balance because <clears throat> there's never enough time to be as deep as we want as designers. And there is there is there there is too big a risk if we don't evolve our practices. Um, and then the other thing is really getting to the what I felt in the heart of Elka's question about responsibility, that there is immense presence and engagement required to really be designing with um, with people. And that is um, that is something we all have to learn how to do and how to balance and how to integrate in our lives. And it's different than sitting in an office. Uh, at a distance. So um, those are things that I feel I'm really taking away from the conversation. Um, in terms of questions on the table, again, two things come to mind, and I did see there was a question in the chat about experimentation, and that is a thing we, we didn't discuss, and it's really true that 
in order to get somewhere new, we have to be able to try things. And so um, I do think that you all in government really need to be thinking about how to create the conditions to try things um, in a way that's safe for people. Um, and that, that, is a, that is a whole realm of research and design and um, policy that's gonna be needed. Um, and then maybe just to end, I would offer that um, the, the word I didn't hear enough today, I think is creativity and how creativity yeah. fits into these co-design processes. It's not just about, um, it's not just about now and people speaking their needs and thinking about reacting to now. It's about how we take leaps to create a better society. And so how do we accept creativity as part of some of our bureaucracies? How, what does that mean to, to, to really take a leap? And um, that feels an important part of this. Otherwise, we end up maybe perhaps co-creating for co-creation itself rather than to get to radically new outcomes. Wow, well, thank you for that. I wish we had another full another hour just to explore all of the ideas that you introduced in your concluding remarks there. Uh, Minister Pirakakis, uh, what will you take from this discussion and what questions would you like to leave for further reflection? What I certainly take from this discussion is that interoperability with the private sector is a European priority and it's an area where we need to focus uh, more even more. Uh, I would say in the coming months, apart from the initial actions in our case that I mentioned uh, before. What's still on the table, I think, and uh, what we need to explore further is how AI can play a role in service design, how this uh, service design equation can become more systematic, even though it has creativity at its core. And creativity, by definition, it's, it's a subjective, uh, has a subjective nature. Thus, uh, we need to see how we can make this more systematic, how we can ingrain this culture, even in our algorithms. And uh, it's one of the areas where we much need to focus on. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, listen, we've gone over time. Um, I, I have to say another Lisbon Council tradition. My favorite thing to hear about an event is when you ask people, how was it? And they say, it was too short. Um, I actually love hearing that because how many meetings have you been to that you thought were too short? Um, but that said, uh, we were we were trying to squeeze an entire world of experience into two very short hours here today. Um, and I think in that sense, rather than wrapping up a project, which is part of what this event was for, uh, this was only a beginning. Uh, so thank you all, uh, both for the knowledge and experience and commitment uh, that you brought to this discussion, uh, but also for leaving us with so much more to think about and do in the coming years. Um, in that sense, very briefly, I'll just thank my team thank the partners from Koval, thank our excellent speakers, and thank all of you for joining as well. And maybe I'll uh, close with uh, Sandy's very inspiring words, that what we really need to do is hold the concerns of now as we are co-creating the future. I can't think of a better note to end on, and thanks again to everyone for coming. Thank you.